I didn't say anything about verse 15. Love, love isn't biting and devouring each other. Uh, you know, this is what animals do, right? Bout and bite and devour each other. I, I think he's thinking especially with words. If we're loving, we don't, we don't eat each other up with what we say. Um, gossip, slander, criticisms uh, that, that can destroy a church. A church can be doctrinally orthodox, right, and be uh, destroyed from within by this, right, by lack of love for one another. But there, there's a lot of need, right, in churches to forbear with one another. We're all, we all, we all, in different ways, we're annoying, right, to each other. You know, when you get married, you work that through, right? It, there's, it's, uh, it's you, two, two different people, and that happens in the church as well. So he says, watch out, or you'll be destroyed by each other. Now, very important in the, this book, right? What does it mean to live out the life God has called us to do? What does it mean to live out this life and not, not be legalistic? To live out this life in a way that we're responding to the grace of God. And for Paul, that means we live our lives by the power of the Holy Spirit. So this is very emphasized in the rest of the letter. Uh, that we, we do God's will, not in our own strength, but by the Spirit. So he begins by saying, walk by the Spirit. Right, so there it is, right, walking step by step. You live your life every day, how? By, by the power of the Spirit, by depending on the Holy Spirit. Walk by the Spirit, and you will not telesita, fulfill, carry out, gratify the desire of the flesh. So we still have desires of the flesh, don't we? They're not gone. They're not gone. We're not perfect. But we, when we walk by the Spirit, the desire of the flesh is not dominant in our lives. So, however, there's a conflict, isn't there? We, the already has come, the new age has come, and yet we live between the times, so we have a conflict between the flesh and the Spirit. The flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with one another so that you are not to do uh, whatever, whatever you want, right? So, so I think this is very similar to Romans 7, which I take to be uh, also Christian experience. There is a conflict. There are desires to sin uh, in, in believers that uh, uh, afflict us. So, but, and I, this is very important, however you take Romans 7, and this text. Paul is fundamentally optimistic. There's a conflict, but I don't think he's saying, do you know this phrase? It, I don't think he's saying it's a stalemate. I don't think he's saying the flesh and the spirit are in conflict, and then you just end up like in between. <laughs> he's fundamentally optimistic because he says, but if you're led by the spirit, you're not under the law. So walk by the spirit, day by day, step by step, and now be led by the Spirit. Be, what does that mean? Be governed by the Spirit. Be directed by the Spirit. Then, isn't it interesting, he says, then you're not under the law. Because remember, when you're under the law, when you're under the law, you're under a curse. When you're under the law, you're under the power of sin. When you're under the law, you're enslaved. So if you're led by the Spirit, you're not under the law because to be under the law is to be under sin. To be under the law is to be under the curse. To be under the law is to be enslaved. But you're not, you're not, uh, you're not to let the flesh dominate, be governed by the Spirit, be directed by the Spirit, and then sin will not dominate your life. I'd like, I'd like, you know, I... I like what Francis Schaeffer says. Francis Schaeffer says, what, is, what does life in the spirit look like? It means that your obedience is substantial, not perfect, but substantial. It's observable. You can see it in someone's life. 
and it's uh, significant. It's, uh, it's evident in their life, right? So <clears throat> there is substantial, observable, and significant obedience in our lives. Uh, John Piper used to say, we have a new orientation, right? Orientation has the idea of direction, right? There's a new direction, but not perfection, we can say. So that's what it means. There's this conflict, but, but he's fundamentally positive. However, this life, this life cannot be lived on our own. Every day, we need the gospel. Every day, every moment, we need, we need the power of the Spirit. I had a, I am, we're not here to talk about this. I mean, I'm, but I am a nuanced cessationist. You know, I know not all of you agree with me on that, which is fine, that's great. But I, I had a, I, I'm telling you the story for a reason. I had a continuationist student come to me in the last two weeks. And basically, he didn't know me. He'd never taken me for a class. We just met walking around the seminary. And basically, he came to me, and he, you know, this is what he said to me. He, I, he was talking to me, and he talked to me for about a half hour. And I, I, it took me a long time to figure out what he was saying to me. But you know what he was saying to me, because I am a nuanced cessationist. He basically said to me, what really bothers me about you is you don't think we need the Holy Spirit. And I was like, what? I said, look, we may have differences, but I said, how, how did you think that about me? I think we need the Holy Spirit every moment. How did you get this idea that I think we don't need the Holy Spirit? I've never taught that. I, I said, without the Holy Spirit, we can't live the Christian life. So, um, and I think that's what Paul's saying here. I need the Holy Spirit every day. I need the Holy Spirit to empower me. I need to walk in the Spirit. I need to be directed and governed by the Spirit. And there's no notion that I don't need the Holy Spirit. <laughs> so when, when the Spirit enters our, in our lives, there's a substantial, observable, significant obedience. Here's an illustration C.S. Lewis gives. You know, when we think about it in real life, C.S. Lewis says, think about... Think about this person who's a Christian who's crabby. Do, do you know what I mean by that word? Uh, what, what's a word, another word for that? Um, he's, uh, can you think of another word for crabby? Easily irritated. He's easily irritated. He's kind of, yeah, he, yeah, he gets annoyed kind of eas easily, and you think, well, that person's a bad Christian, right? They're a bad Christian. They're easily irritated or annoyed. But Lewis says, you have to remember something, and I think this is very helpful when we think of something like this. Part of who we are comes from our families, the way we were raised, and Lewis says, maybe that person has come farther than you because before he was a Christian, he was even more crabby, really irritable, and now he's become much less. He's growing, he's growing. And uh, so maybe he's grown more than you. So we don't want to be simplistic. A person, we may see a person in our church, actually as a pastor, I have some, had some people like this in our church. When non-Christians meet them, sometimes I'm like, oh no, don't go talk to that person. <laughs> because they're kind of, they can be kind of like, say things to people that make them upset, you know? And, uh, but I see, oh yes, that, that person is growing too. They're, they're growing, they're becoming more like Jesus. They're improving, you know? They don't, and maybe they've grown more than us. So don't, let's not be simplistic. This is not given to us so we can judge other people because we don't know how much we've grown. We, we're, we're all to be directed by the Spirit. And, and so I'm saying that person Maybe, maybe they're growing. You know, we want to get to know each other. They're growing. They're repenting when they're not as, uh, when they're irritable and so forth and so on. So there's no excuse for sin, but people are growing at different levels and they come from different places. So I think that's very important to think about. Then he says, how do you know if you're walking in the spirit, though? 
The acts of the flesh, I love this text, the acts of the flesh are, oh, they're so hard to understand. I mean, what's an acts of the flesh? I don't know them. I'm in the flesh or the spirit. The acts of the flesh are obvious. <laughs> uh, they're clear. Paul says, let me tell you. So there's four categories here. Three, the first three relate to sexual sin. Sexual immorality, that's porneia, that's the general word for sexual sin. A couple of us talked about this on the break, you know, porneia is that broad term for sexual sin that includes, you know, incest, sex with animals, adultery, uh, premarital sex, homosexuality, it, any, any kind of sexual sin. And, but sexual sin is often also from, called uncleanness. You're unclean. But before God, using purity language, temple language, right? And then asalgeia. By the way, uncleanness and asalgeia don't always refer to sexual sin, but often they do. Uh, asalgeia has debauchery, this idea of you're just giving yourself over, you know, kind of almost like a sexual orgy, you know, something like that. So that is one sign that one is not walking in the spirit, that one is uh, following the flesh. Sexual sin is very common, in uh, our cultures all over the world, right? It's a, it's a struggle. What it means to walk in the spirit is to get victory in this area. I just want to say, I don't know any of you, if you're struggling in this area uh, and, and uh, in significant ways, or, or uh, really this is all of us, you should be accountable to other people and, and, and tell them what's happening in your life sexually. Uh, so, and, and I think it's very important you be accountable to a person who's stronger than you. Because sometimes in the United States, two people get together and they're like, yeah, we failed. We failed, and like we both failed, and they, they become comfortable in their sin. It's good, to, it's good to confess to someone who's walking in a, in a, in a pure way and uh, who can keep you accountable. So don't keep it private, right? You keep sexual sin private, it's, that's a very dangerous thing. Then, then there are two sins that describe uh, really idolatry. And the first one is the sin of idolatry, right? And then sorcery, you know, pharmakeia. Uh, the, our, we get our word pharmacy from this. But typically, you know, this is not talking about using drugs the way we talk about people who are drug addicted, but using potions and that sort of thing to cast spells upon people, kind of like witchcraft today. Uh, using charms or whatever to influence what happens. So to try to m manipulate reality, right, so you get the desired outcome. Why is that wrong? Because you're not trusting God, right? Instead of trusting God, you're trying to get these devices to say, okay, if I, if I can do this sort of thing uh, and uh, call down a curse on someone, then God will curse them and bless me. But that's not, that's the, the, what's the problem with idolatry? You're not trusting in the true God. You're, you're trusting in a false God. So that's, that's, that's very common. I'll never forget in the United States uh, when Ronald Reagan was the president, I don't know if you've heard that name, but his wife, Nancy Reagan, they were, Nancy was supposedly a Christian, but when things got very tense, she, she, used, she, she used astrologers. Uh, so, right, when people are nervous, they tend to want security. And she went to astrologers to, to help them, to help her know what the future would be, instead of trusting in God, right? She turned to astrology. So, you know, we know this in many countries in, in the West, in many countries in the West where they claim to be atheists, they're falling more and more into these kind of things. Uh, there's the witchcraft and uh, relying on, on, on astrology and things like this because people want to depend on something and they turn. They, even as atheists, they'll turn to these kind of things. I'm not saying all atheists do this, but some. So three sins describing uh, sexual sin, two for idolatry, eight sins Eight sins that are social. So isn't that interesting? Sometimes people think works of the flesh, it's sex, it's body sins. Yes, but it's much more than that. Eight sins that are social. That's the emphasis, isn't it? Eight sins. So, so let's look at those. Uh, you know, I'm just looking at the Greek, but you can see the English too. Hatred or enmities. Being a, be, 
being at enmity with others. That's a work of the flesh. Um, discord or strife. Uh, have, have, not getting along with others. Introducing strife in, in, into uh, the community. Jealousy. Of course, we could talk about all these in great detail, right? Being, being jealous and envious of others. So w when we experience... When we're tempted to do this, what, we're, we're called upon to repent, aren't we? And, and what's a good way to repent if you're feeling jealousy? Pray that God will bless that person you're feeling jealous of, right? If you're feeling jealous of them, say, God, I'm struggling with this. Bless that person. Bless them uh, in, 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 a, in a thousand ways. That's, that's a great way to respond to that, I think. Um, uh, fits of rage, right? Fits of temper, where, where someone gets angry. It's a, it's a plural, right? So that's a good translation there, this, this uh, idea of fits of rage, this anger exploding. Um, this, this is why it's always good to find out what's happening in the home. Uh, you, th things can be hidden. I, I have a friend who was an elder in our church, and his marriage has fallen apart. And uh, we discovered in the home, he was very, very, this is, this is what was happening with his kids and wife. And we never knew. And I wish his wife would have told us. She, she thought she was being spiritual by hiding it. That's not to be hidden, right? And he needed help. And by the time it came out, you know, uh, their marriage had uh, dissolved. That, so the, this kind of fits of rage as a, as a pattern in the life, right? That's a work of the flesh. Um, Selfish ambition, uh, it's plural again, selfish ambitions, uh, dissensions, you know, uh, party spirit, uh, one group against another. They're, these are very similar, right? Heresies, but here's heresies means factions, right? Uh, again, very, very similar to that. And then, and then envy is very similar to je jealousy. So, so here's, here's what divides churches often, right? Not, not loving each other, dividing against each other, uh, doing things that disrupt the unity of the church. We could talk about those things all a long time, but our time is going by, right? Then two sins that relate to kind of like partying, right? Um, he talks about uh, drunkenness, uh, drunkenness and, and orgies, wild drinking parties, we could say today, uh, you know, doing drugs, right? Getting addicted to drugs in different ways. These are all works of the flesh. And Paul says, and things like these. <laughs> we, I could keep going. There's other things. You know, we could read the whole Bible. Uh, he says, and here comes a warning. We talked about warnings. I warn you. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this those who practice these things, those who make this a regular feature of their lives, they will not inherit the kingdom of God. If this is what characterizes, right? We all sin. We all fall short. None of us is perfect. We're all in those sins, right? Somewhere. We've all, even as Christians, we fall short some. But if this is what characterizes our lives, if this is a pattern in our lives, then we will not inherit the kingdom of God. For you, you won't. You, people who do this will not go to heaven. So that this is the God, this is the book of grace, right? God's grace. But God's grace makes a difference in our lives. There's not not meriting salvation, but if the works of the flesh are dominating our lives. That's a sign you don't belong to God. Well, we could say so much more. Well, drinking alcohol, what the, what the Bible says is don't get drunk. So that's the line. Drinking alcohol is fine. Getting drunk isn't, you know? So that's the line. Why, why is someone drinking? Are they drinking, are they drinking to uh, get drunk? Then that's wrong. That's clearly wrong. Listening to secular music, well, the Bible doesn't say listening to secular music is wrong. It depends on what music we're talking about, right? Secular music, there, there's uh, Chris, a lot of Christmas songs are secular music, right? Jingle bells, jingle bells. That, that's not a Christian song. 
There's nothing wrong with that song, but um, so in all such things we use wisdom. Obviously, there's some music uh, that, that, is not, that is not good for various reasons. Usually, it would relate to the lyrics. That's a whole big discussion. I don't think you can argue that certain kinds of rhythms and beats are themselves evil, uh, which some people do. Some people say, well, music with drums is evil. I, I don't agree with that. I don't, I, don't, I don't think that's in scripture. So I, I think that, that is kind of legalistic stuff, you know, yeah. Well, I mean, I, well, we, it, it, we shouldn't. If someone has a habit of anger and dissension, it can be bad enough they should be disciplined. They definitely shouldn't be a pastor. I mean, Paul says that, 1 Timothy 3. You can't be a, you can't be a bully and be a person who's given to anger as a pattern of life, right? So th there should not be such distinction. Obviously, sexual sin is very important, but there's other qual qualifications in uh, what it means to be an elder, and one of them is you, you shouldn't be a drunkard, right? You, you, it's not just sexual sin. So we need to be consistent, I would say, yeah. Okay, the fruit of the Spirit. So again, it's the Spirit. Walk in the Spirit. Be governed by the Spirit. Be led by the Spirit. It's the fruit of the Spirit. This is the Spirit's work in our lives. And, uh, uh, you know, I wish I could spend, the, well, obviously we can't talk about each of these in detail, but we're not surprised love is first, right? I mean, we've already seen love is the heart and soul of Paul's ethic. When he discusses spiritual gifts, right in the middle, he says, what's the most important thing? Love, right? When he talks about food offered to idols in 1 Corinthians 8, what's the problem with those who are so proud of what they know? They're not loving the weak. Love is, the most, is most important. So the first fruit of the Spirit is love. You know this very well. Joy, joy, I can make very brief comments. Joy should not be confused with happy, clappy uh, happiness, right? Joy, joy, joy can be present in sorrow, right? So joy is something very deep and profound that marks our lives. But, but uh, joy, joy is joy, isn't it? <laughs> it's not, you know, we don't say every day, well, I'm miserable again, you know, another miserable day with Jesus, you know? <laughs> so um, joy, joy is a, a happiness in God that's there. I said, I said, literally, as a dad, I, I felt, the most important thing for me in my home is to have a, my relationship with God, but to, that it manifests itself in a joyful presence in our home. That the note in our home is a note of joy and happiness. I think that's super important. Not every moment is a happy moment, right? But there's a joyfulness that pervades the home that's, that, because, you know, I always said, kids know us. Kids know not just what we say, but what's really in our hearts. They're, they are infallible guides, you know? They know us so well. And uh, they, they can tell our true story of what we're really like. You know, my kids know all, my, they know my faults, you know? So uh, they, they see how we live. So joy, peace, I talked about peace earlier, grace and peace, uh, forbearance or patience, so patience, so I've struggled with impatience over the years, my wife would tell you that as well, and I realized impatience is selfishness, right? I wanna go to the first of the line. My schedule's more important than anybody else. Get out of my way, right? I'm first, you know? But what I wanna do has to come first, but that's not loving, is it? Sometimes, so, you know, the way I'm geared as a person Sometimes in elders' meetings, I've been in many, many, many elders' meetings over the years, we have very long discussions, and I'm finished with the discussion, and I think we should stop, because I, I tend to come to conclusions quickly, and, but I've realized over the years, part of what it means for me to love my fellow elders is to let them talk and work it out themselves. Why should I think that when I'm done, everybody else should be done, right? So just because I'm done, what does it mean to love another person? And then I have very, very dear friends 
Do you use this language? Who are verbal processors. Do you talk about that? They, they, they work out what they think by talking, talking, talking. They can be very brilliant. But after five minutes, I know what they're saying. And they take another 55 to tell me, right? <laughs> so, but that's, but I've learned over the years, that's what it means to love that person. Because for them, it's the process of, of working it out. So patience, right? Patience means loving other people. So that's just one, that's a issue I've struggled with. And I've realized, what does it mean for me to love other people? That doesn't mean I'm perfect on this. I still sometimes like, come on, I gotta get this. we got to get done with this. Uh, being kind, being kind to one another. I just say, I, I don't know what happens here, but on social media, even Christians, when we disagree in the United States, often it's not kind. We can disagree, but there needs to be kindness, goodness, pistis there. I think pistis here means faithfulness, being faithful to one another, gentle, uh, being meek. So gentleness is so important. There's, there's times to be, gentleness is not, it's not being uh, uh, wimpy or weak, is it? Gentleness is strength under control, isn't it? But it's being, being gentle, being gentle with others and meek. Paul speaks of the meekness of Christ and then uh, of, of self-control. Uh, so that's a very important fruit of the Spirit as well, to be, to be self-controlled. Uh, sometimes we feel like well, we just have to say something. I, I've said things at times that I knew the Spirit was telling me, don't say it. And then I said it. <laughs> and I'm like, I didn't, I wasn't self-controlled, right? I knew it wasn't the right thing to say in that uh, situation. So this, but the Spirit works in our lives to be self-controlled. Against such things, there's no law, right? These things are the work of the Spirit. No law, no law uh, is going to say these things are wrong, right? It's, this is fundamentally, fundamentally as Christians, we don't live by rules, but by the gospel. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. When did that happen? On the cross. When did it happen in our lives? Yes, when we put our faith in Jesus, when we were converted. That's, so, what, what did he say earlier in the letter, right? He said, I've been crucified with Christ. So, that's when it happened. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. So, we have crucified the flesh with his passions and desires when we became believer. So, yes, we are threatened by the passions and desires of the flesh. There's this tension here, but we're new. Those passions and desires no longer define us as Christians, right? We're new people now in, in Jesus. That's not fundamentally who we are anymore. The old, the old I, the old Tom Schreiner, is no longer fundamentally who I am. And the same with you. You are a new person in Christ, which I could say more, but time is passing. <laughs> Since, yes, question, yes. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. You're not defined by that. So, well, but it makes me think of a debate that's going on in the United States. Uh, there are people who wanna say, who they think same-sex re relations are wrong, homosexual sex is wrong, but they'll call themselves, have you heard this? Is it over here, gay Christian? Have you heard this expression? They'll call themselves a gay Christian. And I say, and many of these people are Christians and they're faithful, but I say, no, 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 no. That, that, that you, you shouldn't, that's like saying, I'm an angry Christian. I'm a lustful Christian. I'm a, I'm a resentful Christian. No, 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 no. no that, that's, that's not who you are anymore, right? We, we may struggle with certain temptations, but we're not defined by these things anymore. And uh, to say, this is what we are, no, that's, uh, we, we are new now. So, yeah, yeah, that's good. Okay, walk by the Spirit, right? Walk by the Spirit, be governed by the Spirit. There's the fruit of the Spirit. And he says, since we live, yes, okay. 
Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think you know, I, I, I think that's a good observation because he doesn't want to use the word works. Not, not that it's wrong. To, uh, Paul talks about good works in the pastoral epistles a lot. So he's fine with that language. But I think in Galatians, he's careful to say, yeah, it's the fruit of the Spirit. It's the result of the Spirit's work in our lives. And it's, it, in some ways, it's not fundamentally a work, right? It's a result of the Spirit's supernatural, transformational uh, power in our lives. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, I think, I think what Paul would say moment by moment, I mean, not, I'm not saying every second you're thinking of this, but as situations come up, I mean, even I gave you that example from our elders meeting, am I going to yield to the Spirit in this moment? Or am I going to give in, or, or, or I'm, I, we're struggling with self-control? Who, do, I, do I say, Holy Spirit, help me, you know? Give me, give me strength to do what's right in this situation, or a sexual sin, right? I'm tempted, or even I've sinned. You know, Lord, help me turn away from this. Help me not to get in, give in to this. So I think we rely on the Spirit in, in those sort of specific ways. And I think it's helpful just in our life together to say to other Christians and when we're in groups with them, hey, here's what I struggle with. Now pray for me about this as well. Yeah. Okay, you know, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just moving along. I'm happy to take questions, but I'm moving along just because of time. If we, if, we live, if we live by the Spirit, so here it is now, we live by the Spirit. If we live by the Spirit, and we do, right? We live by the Spirit, we walk in the Spirit, we're, we're uh, directed or led or governed by the Spirit. It's the fruit of the Spirit, and we live. I think this is, I don't think he means physically live, right? This is eschatological life. If we live by the Spirit, stoic, Komen. Uh, yeah, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us, this word can be, let's march with the Spirit. You know, I love that little, let's march in step with the Spirit. J.A. Packer wrote a book called keep, keep in Step with the Spirit, right? This is the verse. So we, we, we walk in the Spirit. We're governed by the Spirit. It's the fruit of the Spirit. And we march with the Spirit, so to speak. The Spirit's our director, you know? Step by step, we walk in the Spirit. And what does that mean? Let us not become conceited. I actually, you know, I t this is a new step in my outline, caring for one another by the Spirit. The so how do we relate to one another? Let's not provoke and envy each other. So provoking one another, right? When I was in college, uh, and these are all very, they were, so three of us, before I got married, I got married after my junior year of college. I got married when I was 21. But I lived with three guys for three years, and we all became Christians at the same time. One of them, one of them has died in the last few years. God, God took him home. He got esophageal cancer. And, uh, and when one of them is a professor at uh, Pepperdine University now in Southern California. He teaches, he married a a girl from Taiwan, he married a Chinese girl, and he teaches Chinese history. But we were all very immature. We were 18 years old. And this one, my one roommate, and I know he would think he was wrong, he would provoke the other roommate. And he would do that. He wasn't like mad at him, but he would take his clothes, right? We lived on the third floor and dump them out the window. And so they'd go down three stories. He would just do that. He thought it was funny. You know, he would do that. But that provoked. My roommate, right? My other roommate. Like, come on, you know, he didn't like that because he'd come up and then he'd take more clothes and throw them out, you know? So that's provoking, you know, a brother, isn't it? So in some ways, yes, my friend, he is very funny. He is funny in some ways, but also you have to watch that, and sometimes it can be very, with very bad motives, we have to watch that we don't provoke, provoke other people. I love, you know, I love humor and joking, but I do admit there are times, for the sake of a joke, I've said something that's annoyed somebody. You know, I thought it was funny, but actually it wasn't edifying, you know, for various reasons to, to say something. So he says, be careful. Chapter 6, brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin, if someone is found out in a sin, you, you who are spiritual... Here, it's you who live by the Spirit. But 
I don't think Paul's saying here, you, the really great Christians among you, <laughs> actually that's how John Stott interprets this, but I think he's wrong. All of us are spiritual. Every Christian. So I don't think he's saying you who are spiritual, oh, that's the, we all live by the spirit, right? We all have the spirit. So I think he means you who are spiritual, you who are saved, you who are spiritual. So this is every one of us. This is not like, oh, the super great Christians amongst you, the really elite, just the elders. No, it's all of us. You who are spiritual, you have the spirit. Restore, restore that person uh, with a spirit of gentleness. So, so this is like, you know, correcting one another. Be gentle, be meek, be sure not to be harsh. Be careful the words you use. And, and it's so practical, right? Looking to, to yourself lest you also be tempted. Recognize you could fall into the same sin. So deal with that person gently and not harshly. And put yourself in the same position as that person. So that's very practical. Isn't it? We, I have been engaged over 20, the last 24 years, being an elder in our church, we've had probably, mm, I don't know, seven to 10 cases of church discipline for various reasons. And um, my experience is almost every time we do church discipline, the person getting disciplined gets mad at us as elders, almost every time. They're in sin, they're confused, right? But I feel like, I don't claim I've done everything perfectly, but I feel like the Lord has always put it into my heart, you know, I could fall into that sin as well. One time, one, I had one case, we had a young couple, and uh, the husband was really, he wasn't committing adultery or anything like that. He was just a bad husband. He had no idea how to relate to a wife, you know? He, and um, so she decided to leave him. And we didn't know what was going on in their marriage, but I remember I went to see her, uh, and, um, and, and she said, I want to leave my husband. And I told her, I said, look, you know, your husband, he has been a bad husband. I agree with you. And we as elders, we're going to really keep him accountable. And there's great hope for your marriage in the future. But I, I, I know why you're hurting so much, because he has been a bad husband. And, but, but we love you. We love you and we want you to prosper. And, um, but if you leave your husband, that's wrong. Do you think that's wrong? She said, yes. And I said, and if you leave, we will discipline you. And I said, but we're gonna help you in your marriage. And as I'm talking to her, she's just weeping, you know, the whole time. She's just crying and crying and crying. It's just super hard to be there. But also, you know, I, I had things to say to her about this. Well, she, she didn't do what we said. She called her dad, who was in a church in southern Kentucky, and her dad said, you do what you want, daughter. Very bad dad, <laughs> right? Instead of the dad saying, you follow God, he said, you know, you do what makes you happy, which is a which is terrible advice he gave to her. And by the way, you know, we disciplined her, she left, she married again, she got divorced again. You know, she, she's not saved, right? Her husband, with all his faults, he repented, he learned, he got married again, and has a good marriage, you know? God, God worked in his life, and there was great hope there. But I reproved her in a spirit of gentleness. I really believed that, I loved her. Um, we, we hope and pray someone turns around in the ordinary course of life, it's not only church discipline, right? That's just seeing a brother or sister fall in maybe cases that don't require church discipline, right? We might just say to a person, you know, uh, we want to be careful, but we might say, you know, when you interact with people, you're a little bit harsh. We get to a point where we can speak into someone's life. You, you need to be a little more gentle when you talk to people. So. You know, that, that, that's, that's helpful to be, to be told things. I grew up in a family, I grew up in a family that was very blunt. I have seven brothers and sisters, and we would say things to each other like, you idiot, do you do that? <laughs> that never hurt my feelings, you know? That's how we grew up in the family, you idiot, you stupid. But I went to college, and my roommate, uh, I said to him, I wasn't mad at him, I said, you idiot. 
and his feelings were hurt very bad, right? And I was like, what's the problem? You know, you're an idiot. <laughs> so, 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 <laughs> but I learned, I learned, I learned through interacting with him, I actually learned, oh, you know, that, that's not the way to talk to people. You know, that's the way we talked in my family. That's not right. I'm, I'm hurting people's feelings. And when I say things like that, I can't, I can't talk like that with a person. So his telling me how he felt, that's a Galatians 6.1, right? He, he reproved me and said, you know, you're, you're hurting my feelings. And I was like, I couldn't say, well, what's your problem, right? Because basically I'm saying everything my family does is right. But no. You know, I learned, no, 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 that's, that wasn't a loving thing to do. So that's a very practical word, right? Verse 2, bear one another's burdens, and so you fulfill the law of Christ. We talked about that. What does it mean to love each other? It means to, to help each other out. And, of course, there's so many practical ways we can do that, bear each other's burdens. That's what the body is about. That's why church, church membership is important. Being, belonging to one another, caring for one another. I'm sure you guys do that super well. Um, so, I, you know, there's so many things I could talk about. But my wife almost died in 2012. She had a bike accident, a very severe, she forgot to wear her helmet. Uh, she, we don't, know, we don't, no one saw what happened. But she was, uh, she was in, um, uh, for three or four days, we didn't know if she'd live. Then we didn't know if she'd be mentally incapacitated. But the church bore our bur burdens in amazing ways. I have celiac disease. I don't know if you know what that is. So I was in the hospital with her basically all day. People brought me, uh, I'd go home every night, but people brought me lunch and dinner every day. But not only did I have to eat, but I had to eat gluten-free. <laughs> well, you know? And they brought me meals every day. They loved on us. They cared for us. My wife was seven weeks in the hospital, then six more weeks of therapy. As you can see, the Lord has done remarkable things in uh, bringing her back. But that was a practical example, right? Bear bearing one another's burdens. They, people did that in such remarkable ways. People see the love of Christ. So that's a corporate thing. Um, if anyone thinks they are something, when they are not, they deceive themselves. So yes, I'll go a little bit faster. Um, Paul warns against pride here. Each one should test their own actions. So they, then they can take pride in themselves alone without comparing themselves to someone else. For each one should carry their own load. What I'll say about these verses is I think Paul's thinking of the last judgment. And he's saying, first of all, he says, carry one another's burdens. But then he says, on the last day, you stand before God on your own. Don't expect, here, here's the danger. Yes, we care for one another. Don't expect other people to fulfill all your needs. Don't expect that. Yet, so you can, you, you know, there can be people in the church and they're like, no, well, the church doesn't serve me. People aren't caring for me. People aren't loving me. And so Paul's saying, yes, love one another, but also at the end of the day, you're responsible for your life. So there's that tension, right? There's kind of community care, but you, you will give an account to God for your own life. Don't, don't, don't use the excuse, oh, they didn't care for me. The, 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 church, isn't, the church isn't caring and loving. So, I wish I could say so much more there. What does it mean to care for one another? Verse 6, it means pay those who teach the Word of God. So, obviously, some communities, I know that's true in Ethiopia, it's actually true in the United States, especially in rural situations, are very poor. So, pay if you can, right? In some there, there are many churches in the United States, and not in the cities typically, but in rural areas where a pastor has to be bivocational. Do you know what I mean by that? So they have to work, and, 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 uh, um, and uh, the church helps them some. But the ideal is at least one person in every church is paid full time. That's the ideal. It, at, least, at least churches should be devoted to try to, to share all good things. I think he means by that, pay them. And uh, to, be, to be generous is very important. God is not mocked. A man reaps what he sows. 
that's often used, 2 Corinthians, that same saying is used about being generous. Whoever sows to please their flesh, from the flesh will reap destruction or corruption. That's hell. If you sow to the flesh, right, you sowing's like an agricultural thing. You sow seeds to the flesh, you'll reap eschatological destruction. But if you sow to the spirit, here comes the spirit again, right? You'll reap eternal life. So Paul's, Paul's saying, be generous in spirit. One sign, one sign that the Spirit's working in your life is you're generous. So I think he's especially thinking of money, not only of money. So let's not become weary in doing good. Don't get tired of helping other people, especially financially. That's a big part of life, isn't it? People need help. Uh, we need, uh, uh, for at the proper time, we'll reap a harvest if we don't give up. Therefore, as we, we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. I think verse 10 says, if financial resources are limited, and I think this is in 1 Timothy 2, first your family, first you support your family. That's right. That's what God says. Then fellow church members. And then if you have more, unbelievers. So that's the priority, right? Especially, especially we help fellow believers in the community if they're struggling financially. So there's, there's kind of a rule of closeness, right? I don't have a fundamental, I mean, I can help whatever is happening in Ethiopia, but that's not my fundamental responsibility. We, we begin locally where we are, right? So, so our family, our church, then those outside the church, and if Paul says, you know, if you have resources, help outside the church too, that's great. But begin, begin with fellow believers. Okay, I have five minutes. Sorry. The conclusion. Really quick. See what large letters I use as I write to you with my own hand. That's not because Paul had bad eyesight. <laughs> He's saying, I'm putting this in bold. I'm underlining this. This is really important. I think verses 12 and 13 we've already talked about. Those false teachers, they really want to impress you because they get you as converts. They don't want to be persecuted. They don't keep the law themselves. Nobody can, right? They want to boast in your flesh, so they have bad motives. But Paul comes back to what's fundamental. I don't want to boast in anything I do. I may, may I never boast except in the cross. There's the cross again at the end, right? May I never boast except in the cross. May I not boast in myself because by the cross, the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. So that fits, right? With the beginning, by the cross, we're delivered from the present evil age. Remember that? 1-4? By the cross, we're delivered from the present evil age. And now he says it again, doesn't he? I'm crucified to the world. I'm a new person now. Verse 15. Circumcision, uncircumcision, I don't care, Paul says. One way or the other. Who cares about circumcision or uncircumcision? But what counts is the new creation. Ah, the resurrection at the beginning, remember? What, the new age has come. Why is circumcision not required? Because the new creation has arrived. Not in its fullness. There's an already not yet. But the new creation is here. So that new creation has arrived. Live in that new creation. So peace and mercy to all who follow this rule. What rule? That what matters is the new creation. Peace to them. Peace. He started the letter with peace. And mercy to them. Even to the Israel of God. Who's the Israel of God there? If we had time, I'd do a small group. We don't have time. But the Israel of God... I think, in this context, is the church. At the very end of the letter, at the very end of the letter, it would make no sense for Paul to say at the end of the letter, the Israel of God are Jews, Jewish Christians. No, the whole point of the letter is you don't have to be Jewish to be a Christian. You don't have to be circumcised. You're part of the family of Abraham by faith. So this fits at the end of the letter with everything he said. Remember I said in Romans 11, I think Israel was ethnic Israel in that context. But this is a different context. 
So it, would, it fits with everything he says in the letter. No, the Israel of God is the church of Jesus Christ. Those who are circumcised in heart, those who have the spirit, those who have received the benefits of Christ's cross. So, Paul says, from now on, let no one cause me trouble. For I bear in my body the marks of Jesus, the sufferings, right? The beatings he, he received. So I think what Paul's saying here, you want marks on the body? I got them. <laughs> All the beatings I've received. Those are the marks I got. I don't need to be circumcised. Paul was circumcised, right? But he goes, that's not what's important. He says, do you think, do you think I'm trying to avoid persecution? I'm getting persecuted. I'm getting, I'm getting whacked for what I believe. So it's definitely there. So he ends, he ends the letter, we're not surprised, right? The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. This whole letter is about grace, isn't it? And so he ends this letter by saying, the grace, may that grace be yours, brothers and sisters, and then with the amen. <laughs>